Uh, we only had one class before. Today is the second class, and uh, in the previous class, we were just introducing the uh, certification professional business analyst. And in this certification, we were we talked about a lot many things, but now we were discussing about the course outline or the content outline, the syllabus of this course. Um, we said there are a number of domains here. We discussed first domain already, which I can show you by going back. These are the five domains we are required to prepare for. Need assessment, 18% exam questions. Planning, 22%. Analysis, 35%. Traceability and monitoring 15% and evaluation 10%. Uh, out of the uh, need assessment, which was the first one, 18% questions, meaning out of 400 questions, you will be getting 36 questions in need assessment. Uh, we discussed all of these five tasks last time. We were on planning, and in planning, we have 44 questions are 22 percent marks we had already discussed the first four tasks allow me to move on to task five if you are okay with that should i move ahead You can put on your mic and say a word rather than typing every time. Uh, this would be easier. Anyways. So, task 5. Select methods for document control by using documentation management tools and techniques in order to establish a standard for requirement traceability and versioning. So, the first thing here in this task is document control you must understand what document control is and how number two thing is documentation management tools and techniques for doing the documentation control you need to understand the document management tools and techniques so the various tools and techniques we will be studying you should be master of that and why do we do all that that is in order to establish a standard for requirement traceability and versioning. So what do you understand by requirement traceability and versioning? Number one, requirement traceability. Requirement traceability is once you have recognized a requirement and actually you will proceed ahead after that with a project or whatever and then certain activities will be done to satisfy that specific requirement but that requirement originated from somewhere some of the stakeholders or customer had given that requirement in certain circumstances we also understand that stakeholders are not going to be permanent what if that this stakeholder who had given this requirement to be included in in in, in the project that stakeholder is no more valid is the requirement still valid is it still serving the project or the assignment you have got so to trace that at any time during the life of the work we must have a mechanism to trace the requirement all the way back to its origin and all the way forward to the activities tasks work packages and all which have to be created subsequently. So I can move forward or backward on this thread and ultimately I can trace the requirement from anywhere to anywhere. Second point, versioning. Versioning has something to do with the configuration management. How do you keep record of all your documentation? And that is exactly the task of um, task 5 is all about documentation. You prepare a document, for example, and it goes through a number of changes. You ca keep calling them version 1, version 2, version 3, and so on. 
but we keep all the previous versions in record we do not destroy the older versions we do not overwrite the older versions this is called versioning and versioning is a major part of configuration so this is leading us to yet another area which is called configuration management so to to repeat that in task 5 we pointed out the document control methods for document control number 1 point number 2 point documentation management tools and techniques and number 3 point requirement traceability and versioning so out of these three probably you will be getting three to six questions task number 6 define business metrics and acceptance criteria by collaborating with stakeholders for use in evaluating when the solution meets the requirements so in other words i would say this is defining that definition of done when this job can be considered done how can we declare this job done so basically we must have some business metrics for that to measure if the work we started doing has it really met its objectives so according to those objectives we define certain measurements and those measurements are defined as metrics and once those measurements are met that probably will fulfill the acceptance criteria for that deliverable so this acceptance criteria is basically the user acceptance and how do we do that by collaborating with the stakeholders naturally the customer included for use in evaluating when the solution meets the requirement so stakeholder will actually vet that the acceptance has been done and the solution meets the desired requirements it has been checked according to the matrix and now this is declared completed so as i said the task 6 is all about the definition of done so what are the uh, main points here there have to be some business matrix number 1 number 2 acceptance criteria and number 3 is the definition of done itself the evaluating when the solution meets the requirement i would call it in short definition of done he defines what when is it able to be declared as completed or done so far so good yes please uh, without interaction uh, this is just going to be you know i am speaking and speaking and speaking and i don't know if you are getting my message or not okay moving on to third domain and that is analysis the analysis domain centers on requirement management in this order ji assalam alaikum अच्छा आपका क्या माइक ठीक हो गया है ना आप वहां बोल सकती हैं वैसे वो जो भी आपने अच्छा ठीक है नहीं मुझे कोई आवाज नहीं आ रही अब माइक से तो कोई आवाज नहीं आ रही ना 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 अच्छा आपने स्काइप पे किसी से बात करके देखी है अच्छा हो रही बात तो आपकी जा रही है एक मिनट मैं आपको एक एक तरीका बताऊंगा आपके सामने इधर स्क्रीन के ऊपर ये ऑडियो लिखा होगा जो छोटी विंडो है ना इसमें ऑडियो लिखा हुआ है नहीं नहीं ये जो, जो विंडो खुली हुई है गो टू ट्रेनिंग की इसके अंदर जो मुख्तलिफ टैब्स दिए हुए हैं इसमें एक का नाम ऑडियो होगा अच्छा 
अच्छा नहीं नहीं आपने इसको खोला नहीं हुआ फिर ये जो माइक है माइक के ऊपर एक एरो बना हुआ है रेड रन का उस पर क्लिक कीजिए खोला कुछ हाँ इसको इसके ऊपर क्लिक करें खुलता है ये स्क्रीन बड़ी होती है थोड़ी सी हाँ 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 जी 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 कीजिए कीजिए ओके ये जो एरो सा बना हुआ है ना इस एरो पे बस आपने क्लिक करना होता है तो ये वो मेन विंडो को बड़ी खुल जाती है नहीं नीचे आप नीचे की बात कर रही है बिल्कुल बॉटम पे ये बार सी बनी आ रही है ना बार सी बनी आ रही है जी जी ओके सेटिंग की ऑप्शन है सेटिंग सेटिंग पे क्लिक कीजिएगा जरा ऑडियो आ रहा है ना ऑडियो पे क्लिक कीजिए अच्छा अब आप ये देखिए आप जरा बोलिए आपका माइक्रोफोन के अंदर को आवाज के वो लहर नजर आ रही है नहीं नहीं मेरा तो ऑन है आप भी आपकी तरफ से पूछ रहा हूँ नहीं वो नजर आएगा आप बोल रहे हैं ना तो आपकी आवाज उधर नजर आएगा कि बोझ में आ रही है क्योंकि आपकी आवाज मेरी तरफ पहुंच नहीं रही नहीं वो तो टेलीफोन से आ रही है ना मेरे वो क्या कहते हैं कंप्यूटर से कोई आवाज नहीं है इसमें नीचे लिखा आता है कि टॉकिंग कौन बात कर रहा है और उसका फिर वो कन्फिगर इसके साथ कन्फिगर नहीं हुआ हुआ ना हाँ जी इसके अंदर इसके अंदर अगर वो खुद को कन्फिगर नहीं हुआ तो इसमें कन्फिगर करना पड़ेगा आ, हाँ नहीं हुआ होगा ऐसे ही कुछ है आपका इधर लिखा हुआ नजर आ रहा है माइक्रोफोन ऑडियो के नीचे हाँ जी तो म्यूट खत्म करें ना इसका म्यूट खत्म करें हाँ जी करें नहीं नहीं तो अच्छा 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 आप ये कीजिए कि वो जो ऊपर टॉप पे बना हुआ था ना माइक जो पहले ऊपर बना हुआ था उसको देखें वो रेड है या ग्रीन है कलर कलर क्या ग्रीन है ग्रीन होना चाहिए उस पर क्लिक करें जहां पे वो ग्रीन नहीं है ना उस माइक के ऊपर क्लिक करें तो वो ग्रीन हो जाएगा फिर आपकी आवाज आएगी बस फिर वो ये यही मसला है इसको आप इसको दिखा लीजिएगा ये मसला भी है कि इस तरह जी कन्फिगर हुआ हुआ है नहीं नहीं कन्फ... सब कुछ कन्फिगर्ड है सब कुछ ठीक है सिर्फ एक्टिव नहीं हो रहा पता नहीं क्यों नहीं हो रहा हाँ जी चले एनी वो तो खैर हम उसके ऊपर कर सकते हैं बात बट वो मुझे थोड़ा सा रिस्पॉन्स चाहिए होता ताकि मुझे पता चले कि जो कुछ हम बात कर रहे हैं वो कौन सी ये चीज है जी बिल्कुल ठीक थैंक यू राइट जी तो नेक्स्ट इज द एनालिसिस एंड एन एनालिसिस वी ऑल्सो अगेन हैव फाइव टास्क लेट अस सी इफ देर एनी एडिशनल एट एट टास्क टोटल एट टास्क फॉर एनालिसिस एंड दिस इज द हाइएस्ट परसेंटेज थर्टी फाइव परसेंट मीनिंग सेवेंटी क्वेश्चन विल बी फ्रॉम दिस एरिया First of all, the first task in analysis elicit or identify requirements using individual and group elicitation techniques. In order to discover and capture requirements with supporting details, that is the original and the rational. Now, I I uh, told you earlier in the previous lecture, what do elicit mean? Elicit means 
that you are seeking information from the stakeholders about the requirements. So once you are seeking, one, one thing is gathering requirements. Gathering requirement is something like, you know, you are asking someone what are your requirements and that person is telling you. But remember, your stakeholders will not always be able to tell you their own requirements. So somehow you have to force information out of them by questioning, by, you know, different other means. So that all those using all those means to extract information about the requirements from the customer. These are called eliciting information or elicitation, elicitation of requirements. So you elicit and then identify those requirements. How do you do that? You can use individual or group elicitation techniques. Individual elicitation could be the interviews or whatever you are doing with a single stakeholder. And maybe if there are some group discussions, facilitation sessions uh, in group where you are eliciting information from a group of people, then it is a group elicitation. So both types of elicitations can be there, individual as well as the group. So uh, specific techniques for both you must be knowing. And why do you do that? It is in order to discover and capture requirements with supporting details. So we want to capture all the requirements as much as we can and especially like the origin of this requirement, what is the rationale of this requirement and all that. I mean, there could be many other uh, attributes of each requirement which you can specify yourself. Then the second task in analysis is analyze, decompose and elaborate requirements using techniques such as dependency analysis, interface analysis and data and process modeling in order to collaboratively uncover and clarify product options and capabilities. Once you have the requirements in front of you, now is the time to analyze those, those requirements. If some requirements are too large to understand, you may have to break them down, decompose them into smaller parts as if you can understand them better and elaborate each requirement and for that, you may have to use certain techniques like which requirements are dependent upon who, what requirements, how they are interfaced with each other. So these are different analyses you have to carry out like dependency analysis, interface analysis and modeling like data and process modeling in order to, why are we doing it? In order to collaboratively, collaboratively uncover and clarify product option and capability. Previously, we just identified the requirements. Now we are clarifying the requirements. And this will clarify and this will, you know, make the product visible to us. The scope of the product would be defined by this. You would be able to better understand what should be the functions and features of the product you are, uh, you are actually supposed to design. Third task is evaluate product options, capabilities by using decision making and valuation techniques in order to determine which requirements are accepted, deferred or rejected. Now, uh, now that we have the product options available to us, you evaluate those product options. Previously what we did was we had the requirements, we analyzed them, decomposed them and ultimately what we, we created we clarified the product options. Now we have the product options and capabilities. We are now evaluating them by using certain decision making and valuation techniques. So here we need to have emphasis on decision making and valuation techniques. You must understand these decision making and valuation techniques. These will be asked in the exam from for task 3. What were the uh, techniques there in uh, task 2? There we, uh, the techniques were dependency analysis, interface analysis, data processing model, etc. Here we have decision making and valuation techniques. And why do we do that? In order to determine which requirements are accepted, deferred or rejected. Now based on this product option capability analysis, these techniques we use, they will actually let us 
know why our requirement is accepted, why our requirement is not accepted, rejected, or deferred. So that will give you sufficient reason for that because you know the product analysis of the product options and capabilities and you have evaluated them and even after doing that some of the requirements we do not go exactly with the product options they will be rejected some will be in line with the product options so they will be accepted and some will be deferred they, they may be handled in future but they are not rejected task number four allocate accepted or deferred requirements by balancing scope schedule budget and resource constraints with the value proposition using prioritization dependency analysis analysis and decision making tools and techniques in order to create a requirement baseline now before we can create a requirement baseline the requirements which were accepted and deferred you see the rejected is rejected we do not need to process it any further but the item which have been deferred they may have be, may have to be considered at a lower priority but they will still remain in the list of requirements whereas accepted items are definitely you know to be done and now when we put them all together all the accepted and deferred requirements now we need to prioritize them as if the most important requirements comes on top and the least important comes at the bottom and all deferred requirements will go towards the bottom so here we are balancing the scope schedule budget and resource constraints with the value proposition value proposition is which is uh, going to be more cost benefit uh, more beneficial for for, for decision making tools and techniques so value proposition will actually determine the prioritization the actual flow of prioritization which is the, from highest to lowest dependency analysis will be also looked into and you will use certain decision making tools and techniques in order to create the requirement based and once the requirements have been finalized and you know uh, you have created a prioritization and dependency analysis has been done then you seal the requirement you get them approved by the boss and you seal the requirements that these requirements cannot now be changed without the permission of the boss now once you, once you have you know created the requirement baseline this baseline has to be as i said approved by the boss so obtain task 5 is obtain sign off on requirement baseline using decision making techniques in order to facilitate stakeholder consensus and achieve stakeholder approval so a stakeholder has to be part of it so you will facilitate stakeholder in understanding what the requirement baseline looks like and convincing them to approve it and if they approve it then these are the requirements which you will be following later right so if they do not approve it naturally whatever their desire desire needs and expectations they will have to be included in it so task 5 took us as far as obtaining the sign off on the requirement baseline task 6 now write requirement specification now that the requirement baseline the basic requirements have been set that these are the requirements which are to be met and this has been agreed and signed by the stakeholder and, and the boss now all those requirements are uh, uh, specifications for those requirements are created in a bit more detail and how do you do that we can use various processes like use cases like user stories um, data and interface details in order to communicate requirements that are measurable and actionable that is suitable for development okay i will ask you a question i don't know how can you answer it have you ever uh, heard about user stories what are user stories uh, i'll tell you something what if you call me on Skype as well? Let the uh, 
uh, this software run you call me on Skype so when you call me on Skype uh, we can speak there and we can listen to each other while I can put off my mic from here or, or do something about it is it okay Screen prototype, yeah, screen prototype is, uh, what do they call it, uh, mock-up. We create a mock-up when we, we, we start an assignment. First we create a mock-up, then we get this, that mock-up approved. And once uh, customer is okay with it, then we move ahead with further development. But user story is something different. What you answered is not really um, very correct. Uh, use cases and user stories, both are slightly different. But use cases is more serious term, but user stories is more interesting and more practical term. Uh, actually, what happens is when, uh, especially in agile environment, when you go to the uh, you go to the customer for collecting the requirement, and who goes to the customer in agile? Uh, it is not the scrum team or project manager or somebody who goes to the customer to collect the requirement. Uh, the Product owner is usually the project director or project sponsor, something you would like to call him. Uh, he is a person who is the product owner, and product owner is responsible for creating, uh, for collecting the requirements or eliciting the requirements from the customer. And he plays a very important role. Uh, now, customer is unable to define what he wants. Therefore, customer will tell you um, epics. Epics is a term which is bigger than stories. Like you know, in Urdu language, you call kisse. Wo aapko kisse sunata hai. He will tell you epics. And once he is telling you epics, in those epics, he is trying to portray his problems in the system. For example, PIA uh, help desk or uh, the complaint cell. Um, uh, has one one problem and they are tr trying to express their problem yes sir when uh, somebody comes to the counter the queue management is so difficult that he has to wait for half an hour in the queue and by the time he, he comes to the head of the queue he, the, that person is uh, um, out, out of temper and um, the ac is not working and this that so this is a specific scenario you uh, the customer has created and not only that to give it more life they use personas as well they say mr jameel has come to the counter one day and when he uh, came in it was very hot outside uh, acs were not really working and the queue line was very long and uh, by the time mr jameel reached the top of the queue uh, he felt that the uh, the person conducting him was not really very in, uh, not in a very good mood he did not uh, care much about him and uh, asked some questions which were not relevant and mr jameel was very angry how to solve this problem so this is a whole epic story he has told you a complete kissa now out of this kissa out of this epic there are so many requirements you can point out number one queue is not managed well number two air conditioning is not working number three that person who is uh, you know attending is uh, not uh, 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 not user friendly not uh, is not satisfying the customer so if you want to fix these problems you have to break this epic into small user stories and there are three stories in it again i would say number one story long queue number two story uh, uh, AC not working and number three story the attendant not courteous so now uh, these three small stories which are broken down from the same epic will actually form part of the product backlog what is the product backlog in agile all the requirements which are received in requirements we call them user stories all the user stories are 
collected and put into a basket. So this basket is a product backlog where all the uh, functional features and requirements about the product are collected. Uh, so what we have done right now, we have broken the bigger stories into smaller stories. So those epics were broken down into stories and there were other uh, things which were uh, which could not be broken down so we accepted them as user stories so i will have uh, all the stories broken down to a uh, specific level and that level is called uh, user stories and this is now uh, a refined back product backlog the product backlog has been refined uh, the bigger things have been broken down into smaller parts so it has been defined now uh, the other important thing we need to do there is that is prioritizing the requirements. The most useful and most valuable, most important requirement must be met first and then the next, then next and then next. So if we can somehow put all these user stories in order of priority, that is called refined and prioritized product backlog. You see how the requirements are uh, put into uh, a specific box and as if they can be used later so now whoever wants to start working he will start from top the topmost user story would first be done then second then third then fourth and in the sequence this job will be done so once again uh, write requirement specifications using uh, use cases or user stories data and interface details in order to communicate requirements that are measurable and actionable. So this was task six. Task seven. Well, uh, Busha, the flow charts are different. Flow chart shows how the work will be done. First this process and once this is done, then the next process, if then, you know, you, you put, put the uh, decision box there if it is so then this this way otherwise that way so that shows how the job will be done right now we are not asking you to tell me how the job will be done i am just asking you uh, what are the requirements so requirements uh, do not need any flowchart prioritization is whichever requirement is to be done first which is most important which has the highest value must be prioritized on the tab top again we don't need any flowcharts for that. Are we okay with that? I'm sorry if I miss out some of your chats because I'm speaking and when I'm speaking sometimes uh, I may not be able to see what you have, you have written. Okay. Seventh task is validate requirements. You see so far what we have been doing. Everything is very systematic. Just don't worry. If you can somehow, you know, wrap it around your mind, how the things are working here, you see, it is all being done in a very natural flow. So once the requirements specifications have been written down, now you have to confirm them. You have to validate them. And naturally to do this, again, we have some tools and techniques and those are documentation reviews, prototypes, you, you, you wrote prototype earlier, Prototype is for this purpose. Prototype is not for collecting the requirement. Demos. This is the time when we will show that uh, what we called it uh, mock-up. So prototype or demo or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, those, those mock-ups etc. They, they will be done here. And other validation methods by which we, we are sure that these requirements have been confirmed. That uh, this is what the requirement we gathered and we presented it to the stakeholder and stakeholder has agreed to it. Right? So this is the validation we are getting. And what is the validation? The requirements are complete. We have understood them. Accurate. They are aligned with the goals and objectives and they will deliver value. Value proposition. So this validation is my seven task. So the important thing about seven task is this is the validation. And uh, what all are involved in it, the various tools and techniques, which include reviews, prototypes, demos, etc. And uh, 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 the confirmation we want to get is 
whether the requirements are complete, accurate, and aligned with goal objectives and value proposition. So these are the major points here. You can keep under, underlining the important items. Uh, task number eight, which is the last task of this domain, domain is analysis. Now you elaborate and specify detailed metrics and acceptance criteria using measurement tools and techniques for using in evaluating whether the solution meets the requirement. Now there's, there's a difference. You have just read acceptance criteria somewhere else also. Where was that? Please look back and see where was the acceptance criteria. It was when we obtained where was it? Just let me. Okay. Let me take it down. Yeah. Task 6 in domain 2. Task 6 in domain 2. We said define business metrics and acceptance criteria. So these were the major business metrics. The business case we created and the, the major KPIs of the business and the acceptance criteria at a very high level. That was one acceptance criteria. Now we are talking about the detailed acceptance criteria for all the requirements. This is not a high level. This is a low level. This is a detail level. Right. So uh, in this task, we we will establish uh, the detailed matrix. Previously in task uh, six of domain two, as you said, uh, that was what? That was the acceptance criteria for the high level high level business needs now we have detailed requirements in front of us they have been validated now we have to create the detailed matrix and establish acceptance criteria again using the measurement tools and techniques for use in evaluating whether the solution meets requirement so this if the uh, this final check is passed if the solution is according to the requirement and acceptance criteria is fulfilled then this product is okay. It is to be handed over to the customer then. Okay. Then we move on to domain 4. Right. Uh, domain 4 is traceability and monitoring. This is just like, you know, in project management, after having done all that uh, planning, initiation planning, we are we are having monitoring and control here in business analysis we have traceability and monitoring it is almost equivalent to monitoring and control of project management but in business analysis we call it the traceability and monitoring traceability you understand i have already explained it to you how requirement traceability matrix was established how we established right in the beginning how to track the requirement according to the, those traceability matrices now is the time when we are going to do this tracking. So our ta first task is track requirements using traceability artifact or toolkit tools. Capturing the requirement status. Number one, what is the current status of each requirement? What is the source? What is the relationship? Including the, if there is any dependency. We all already have done the dependency analysis. In order to provide evidence that requirements are delivered as stated. We have to ensure that whatever was the requirement in the requirement baseline, the uh, uh, the requirements are being delivered exactly in accordance with that. And if there is a variation, then that variation has to be uh, updated into the requirement baseline as if we can redo our effort which we did wrong. Task two, monitor requirements throughout their life cycle. This tracking requirement, task one, was just not uh, one-time thing. Now, once we have 
we we keep tracking requirements as they happen and then we keep monitoring each requirement and this is a continuous cycle throughout the life cycle using our traceability artifact or tool which were which we were talking earlier to ensure why are we doing it to ensure appropriate supporting requirements artifacts such as models documentation and test cases are produced you know what are the test cases test cases are uh, for user acceptance yeah, acceptance criteria to meeting the acceptance criteria there are certain tests you carry out so to test whether a certain capability is present or not we test the case and if test case is passed then we say okay this requirement is complete so it is accepted by user so uh, that's exactly what mean what we mean supporting requirement artifacts like uh, test cases are produced reviewed approved at each point in the life cycle so each point what is the each point life cycle is divided into certain stages at end of every stage we have to do this we have to produce review and approve <clears throat> these artifacts requirement artifacts task 3 update your requirement status as it moves throughout the life cycle by communicating with appropriate stakeholders and recording changes in the traceability artifact or tool in order to track requirements towards closure now looking at the review the output of the review and the approval we will update the requirements if there is any change naturally if there is a change change request will be, will be there and requirements will status will be changed uh, throughout the life of the cycle this will keep happening by uh, how how will we make this updation by communicating with the appropriate stakeholders we we'll talk to all the, the relevant stakeholders and if there are any changes we'll record them in the traceability artifact or tool in order to track requirements towards closure so until and as the, pro the whole thing is closed uh, these uh, this traceability thing will go on and on and on and wherever there are changes we will move the change request fourth task is communicate requirements status to project manager and other stakeholders using communication methods in order to keep them informed of requirement issues conflict changes risks and overall status remember so far project manager has not come into being and if at all project manager has started you know doing something you know looking around what about uh, collecting data about the project then project manager and all the relevant managers whoever is uh, going to be somehow affected by uh, our requirements would actually be communicated with they would be told that these uh, through different communication methods they'll be told they'll be informed of all the issues which are coming in requirements what are the conflicts what are the changes what are the risks within the requirement and overall status of the requirement so this is this communicate communique will go on task 5 manage changes to requirements by assessing impacts previously we said that we will uh, compare and uh, 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 result change can be uh, uh, can be requested as a result of that now we are saying manage the change to requirements by assessing their impact dependencies risks in accordance with the change control plan and comparing to the requirement baseline in order to maintain the integrity of the requirements and associated articles whatever we are doing whatever we are doing that must update the records in your art artifact your document should be updated accordingly there are relevant changes which have uh, taken place they must go through proper chain control process and ultimately they must be uh, depicted on your in on your baseline as if when we are accepting something some requirements the completion of the requirements then there must be a proof available for that otherwise the integrity of the requirements will be harmed if the 
requirements which had to be fulfilled are different than what have been fulfilled then it, that means the integrity of registration requirements has not been properly taken care of so if we keep making the change request and through change control process we can keep updating the requirements in the baseline that means whenever we are doing the final check the latest change change uh, latest version of requirement baseline uh, it is the sample against which we will check last but not the least is evaluation uh, this is the last evaluation after which the job of business analysis is finished and he hands it over to the next party uh, there are again four tasks here first he validates the solution solutions test results reports and other test evidence against the requirements acceptance criteria in order to determine whether the solution satisfies the requirements or not so the validation of the solution test results and reports etc against the requirement acceptance so acceptance requirement acceptance criteria was kept on one hand and on the other hand the solution test results uh, are compared with it and we what we are trying to do we are trying to determine whether the solution is in accordance with the requirements task 2 analyze and communicate the solutions identified gaps and deltas using quality assurance tools and methods in order to enable stakeholders to resolve discrepancies between solution scope requirement and developed solutions uh, whatever the result of uh, this task one is the validation of the test results they are then to be analyzed and communicated to the relevant stakeholders the solution will identify certain gaps or deltas where things are not according to the quality assurance to, uh, tools and techniques may be used in there we basically want the stakeholders to be updated they must be enabled as if to resolve any discrepancy between the solution scope requirement and developed solution so all should be on the same page whatever has been produced must be analyzed must be communicated to the stakeholders they must look at it and if there is a discrepancy then that discrepancy must be bridged third task is uh, obtain stakeholder sign off on the developed solution so whatever the solution you have devised you see we have not eradicated the problem but we have created a solution now this solution will be tested solution will be tested not the result because product is not created as yet Pro uh, as, as a result of uh, the business analysis a solution will be suggested and then the project manager will come and take it on as a project and deliver that product so this story of business analysis is all before the project manager starts working so obtain the stakeholder sign off on the developed solution using decision making techniques in order to proceed with deployment and once that is done the last part is evaluate the deployed solution once the solution has been deployed it is to be evaluated again using some evaluation techniques in order to determine how well the solution meets the business case and value proposition so these are the five domains and in these five domains you have seen we have got approximately five to four five or you know kind of eight tasks on the tops on top of all of these five domains there are certain skills and knowledge knowledge which a project uh, sorry business analyst must have so there are 10 things listed here and you might have noticed that these things are uh, somehow mentioned in the tasks as well analytical tools and techniques for example how to decompose a requirement how to what is progressive elaboration dependency analysis gap analysis impact analysis risk analysis and other assessments backlog management i did mention something about product backlog so how do you manage it how the job is done we, we pick the top most most valuable task to be done first highly prioritized task business rule analysis 
tools and techniques. For example, we have decision tables, decision trees, our rule catalogs. These all are business rule analysis. Change control tools and techniques. Collaboration tools and techniques. Communication skills tools and techniques, which may include uh, communication could be written, could be spoken, you know, whatever. So it could be a technical writing or business writing or you know, presentation skills or verbal or non-verbal communication, all types of communication skills. Conflict management and resolution tools and techniques. Contingency planning, keeping reserves. Data analysis tools and techniques like data modeling, data dictionary, state diagram, etc. Last but not the least is decision making tools and techniques like Delphi technique, multi-voting, consensus building, options analysis. So all these techniques. Now, if you are a PMP already, you might know that uh, most of these techniques are also being used in project management. But here some of the techniques are uniquely new. But whatever, these techniques are not akin only to business analysis. They are not specific techniques for business analysis. These are used for many, many disciplines. So, for example, conflict management, you have to do, deal with conflict management in every subject. But to talk about the business analysis, the project management alone. Then we have got other uh, tools and techniques, development methodologies, where you are using agile, iterative, incremental, or waterfall, documentation management tools and techniques, elements of requirement management plan, what should be included in the requirement management plan? What are the detailed ingredients of the requirement management plan? Then elicitation tools and techniques like brainstorming, focus groups, interviews, uh, workshop facilitation, observations, document analysis, etc. Estimation tools and techniques. We have estimation poker, quadrant analysis, averaging, then facilitation tools and techniques. Interface analysis like prototyping, storyboarding, interoperability, leadership principles and skills. This also you must know. Lessons learned and retrospective and measurement tools and techniques like e-language, service level agreements, negotiation tools and techniques, organizational assessment like organizational readiness, planning tools and techniques like strategic and tactical planning, political and cultural awareness, prioritization tools and techniques like multi-voting, weighted system and Moscow, problem solving and opportunity identification tools and techniques. Again, brainstorming, value engineering, scenario analysis, and user journey map. Process analysis tools and techniques like user st stories, use cases, process models, data flow diagram which you mentioned. This is also a process analysis. Project methodologies, waterfall, agile, whatever. Quality management and reporting tools and techniques. More requirement traceability tools and techniques. Requirement types must be known to you. Root cause analysis, what it is and how it is done, five whys, scheduling tools and techniques, stakeholder analysis, system thinking, validation tools and techniques, valuation tools and techniques, verification methods and techniques, and version control tools and techniques. You see, there are a lot many things. There are 40 different topics which are which you need to know and understand. So far, so good. Again, up. And बिजनेस एनालिसिस जो आप एग्जाम दे रहे हैं ना उसका ये सिलेबस है अगर ये सारे टॉपिक्स आप कवर कर लें और अच्छी तरह से समझ लें तो प्रॉब्ली यू वोंट हैव एनी प्रॉब्लम जी जी
एक ही चीज की कोई बड़ा मुस्ला नहीं है अगर आप समझ रही हैं कि पहले इस वाइफ भी आप किसी से बात कर चुकी हैं तो हो जाएगी फिर मसला कोई नहीं है इस जरा सा किसी को दिखा दें कि जरा यार देख लो तो ये रिश्ते पर क्यों नहीं चलता syllabus let's see how can you book your exam pba exam the exam fee is 405 dollars for a member if you are not a pmi member then you are you are going to appear as a non member and you will have to pay 555 dollars as far as paper based testing is concerned this is not available in pakistan so forget about it so the only thing applicable to you is computer based testing and you either as a member or as a non member i will strongly suggest that you become a member first and then take benefit of this rebate what is the membership fee actually that might be the next question the membership fees is uh, One twenty-nine dollars per year. For the first time, you have to pay another ten dollars. That makes it one thirty-nine. And if you need to join any local chapters, like if you are in Karachi, uh, you will like to join the Karachi chapter. So Karachi chapter, you have to pay another twenty dollars. It comes out to be one. Hundred and fifty-nine dollars for one year. From next year on, you will be paying one forty-nine dollars. Uh, I understand that uh, people think that uh, there is no fun in wasting so much money, but I suppose uh, this is worth it. It's not only that you take the membership only for one year, pass your PBA exam, and then forget about it. No, you must. Uh, you know take full advantage of it and keep your membership updated every year as far as the pm pba exam is concerned once you pass it then this certification is awarded to you for a duration of 3 years after every 3 years you have to renew your certification not by giving another exam but simply by fulfilling certain requirements and if you fulfill those requirements which are um, getting new education of, of about 60 hours in 3 years which is peanuts then you for renewal you have to pay 60 dollars if you are a member and if you are not a member you will have to pay 150 dollars so this is the renewal fee god forbid if you do not pass the exam in your first attempt the second and third attempt if within the same year actually when you apply for pba exam 
they will give you they will approve your when they will approve your application they will give you one complete year of approval so you can appear any time in the exam in one complete year of time of your choosing uh, if you appear say within next three months you will still be having nine months to go if you pass well and good if you don't pass then you can reappear in the exam twice within this remaining period and for that you do not have to pay full fee you have to pay only the exam fee not the processing fee or that would be for members to 75 dollars and for non members 375 dollars so that means your second attempt is going to be cheaper and same for your third attempt but remember if you do not pass in three attempts pmi will ban you from applying for at least one year and if you still want to do pba then you have to wait for another year and then you can apply but anyways i'm i'm sure that you will be able to pass in the first attempt and if God forbid you couldn't do that, you will definitely do it in second attempt. So just plan for that. One hundred and uh, how much I told you? One fifty nine dollars. Then four hundred and five dollars, uh, and keep two seventy five dollars also on one side for uh, reappearance of the exam. Okay, as I said. The exam eligibility period given to you is one year, but that starts after your application has been accepted. After your application has been accepted, meaning what? All the criteria you have shown, uh, you have completed uh, the, the eligibility criteria, you have fulfilled, and the PMI has accepted after. Uh, having done the audit, if at all they need to do the audit. Uh, the, the day they approve your application, you they will give you one year. And as I said, in this one year, you can maximum attempt three times. First time, you, uh, you will pay the full fee, um, $405 for members, and remaining times $275 for members. Uh, once uh, that letter comes to you, you will be provided in that letter some details. Your PMI eligibility ID will be given to you. And you will be uh, given a time period, start date and end date, in between which this eligibility period is valid and you can appear in the exam during that one year period. And there will also be provided some examination scheduling instructions. So, uh, they will also provide you a website. You will go to that site and you will book your exam. And um, using your eligibility ID and your password, you will schedule your exam at your own will. And you can sit in the exam. And the choice is yours. There is no date for the exam. You fix the date for your exam. Any working day, you can appear in the exam. And it is also not necessary that you appear. Um, only in Karachi or anywhere, you can go and um, appear in Dubai, you, you can go and appear in New York, nobody cares. You can appear from anywhere in the world. Okay. One thing which is very recent, and that is PMI had been doing its testing through Prometric testing centers for which this website address is given. But PMI has recently announced that they are shifting from Prometric to View. View is another service. They provide. They also provide online exam uh, exams. And if you go for View, uh, the procedure might be almost similar, but naturally the site will be different. Probably they are in uh, invoking it. By after first May, all the exams, uh, no, not first May, after some date in April, 
some date in April, by say by the end of April, uh, all the exams will be shifted to view. So if you are appearing in uh, PBA exam before that, uh, you can take advantage of Prometric testing site. Uh, later, otherwise, view will be the only possibility available to you. Uh, I am not sure about uh, you are in Karachi, so I don't. I'm not sure what type of uh, view centers are there in Karachi and how many are there. But my personal experience about view and Prometric in Islamabad is Prometrics are highly professional, but view is not really that good a test center. I don't know why PMI has decided to go over view. But anyways, whatever the decision is, and uh, whensoever you plan to exam, uh, appear in the exam, that all matters for that. Okay, some instructions. How and when to book the exam. Naturally, you know that you have been given one complete year to sit in the exam. But it is not that that you want to appear tomorrow and today you will book the seat and go and sit in the exam. No. What if you plan to give the exam tomorrow and when you try to book the exam, you find out there are no, no seats available. Houseful. So what will you do? So to protect against that, PMI suggests that from the date you prefer to appear in the exam, six weeks earlier you must book your exam. At least six weeks earlier. Uh, this is a precaution because these testing sites are not only conducting the PMI exams, they are conducting a lot of many other exams like Microsoft, Java and Sun and uh, TOEFL and GRE and whatever and whatnot. So, but if there is a crowd of TOEFL students going there and appearing in the exam, in that case, it will not be, you know, you may not be able to get your desired date. But six weeks is an enough advanced time you can definitely be able to get an appropriate date of your choosing. This is one instruction that six weeks earlier you must book your date. The second instruction, normally people what, what they do, they know they have one year, so they sit back and relax. They procrastinate. They do not take action until it is too late. At the very last moment, maybe the very last month, they decide, okay, I should book the exam. And when they try to book the exam, and uh, due to the rush in the center, you could not, cannot book it, then there is no remedy to that. Your money will be lost. PMI is not going to help you at all. So the precaution is that if your expiration date of eligibility criteria is nearing three months before the expiry you must book your exam date anyways so three months is a very very safe bet and there is a, there are high chances that you will be able to find a nice date in the next three months and sit at the exam but if you ask me I would suggest, do not wait for the last month. You could target three to six months preparation. And I would rather say three months is more than enough. You should book your exam. After the course finishes, calculate from there onwards. You keep preparing your application. And the day we finish the course, you submit your application. After six weeks, by that time, your uh, you know approvals will also be coming. So as soon as your approval comes, after 15 months, uh, 15 days, uh, you must book, book your exam. That means after another six uh, six weeks or 15 days, you will have your exam. If God forbid you do not pass, then give 
do not be emotional do not think that just uh, i did one question wrong and if i appear it uh, sit in the exam again tomorrow i can fix that no you can't fix that go back home find the faults you have done prepare more vigorously and give it time say give another three months time before you appear in the exam so that way you will get rest you will be having uh, enough time to prepare on your mistakes and ultimately you will be able to inshallah pass as i said uh, eligibility period i have told you is it possible that the pmp exam can be cancelled due to some emergency can you cancel your exam okay there are two things number one PMI has made the rules a bit more strict now. Previously, they used to allow within 48 hours that you can change your date, last 48 hours. But now they have extended that to one complete month. So, if you have got more than one month left for the exam and you want to change the date of exam, you can do that without any additional cost but this change will only happen once second time you try no matter if even more than one month is available but very next day you try to do another change pmi will uh, uh, will ask you to pay more you have to pay the fees again okay so if you apply one month earlier you don't have to pay anything for the first time if you apply within one month but not within 48 hours and the, in, i mean to say the last 48 hours you are not allowed to change the exam if you do you will have to pay full fee but if you apply for change between one month period i mean 30 days to 28 days before the exam the fixed fee of 70 dollars will be charged but if you are within the last two days of the exam you will be charged the full fee Okay, but if you could not reach the exam center due to an emergency, PMI does allow that. <clears throat> but the emergency should be genuine. What genuine emergencies can be considered by PMI for an excuse are number one, medical emergency. You yourself are you yourself have fallen ill and you are unable to appear in the exam so you can send in the medical certificate uh, to pmi and uh, that you should do within 72 hours of the exam time if you delay it they will not accept your argument so within 72 hours you must send them the proof of medical emergency or if you are a soldier then and you have been deployed in the field the military deployment uh, proof of that will also serve as an excuse if you have a death in immediate family and by immediate family i mean the immediate blood relations father mother brother sister etc so death in immediate family then also you can be allowed or illness in immediate family this also may allow you to extend your date and last chance is natural disaster it is a flood tsunami or something which due to which you could not reach the exam center that in all these cases you must inform pmi within 72 hours of the exam time and only then they may consider and allow you an additional chance When you go to the exam center, 
what all should you carry first of all you must have at least one photo id and the valid photo ids could be the driving license if you are a serving soldier your military id can serve as a valid id your passport is the best choice best it is best for you to, you can take along your passport and show them and your national identity card <clears throat> they need three different identities and if you carry any three of these or all four of them then there is no problem because maybe you know you take along your id card and when you reach the center they tell you oh, oh this is expired uh, we can't entertain it and you have to go back home you must carry at least three identities along with you out of which at least one should be a photo id now i have told you the best identifications uh, which they will recognize driver license military id passport and nic what else can they entertain they can also entertain your employee card from your company <clears throat> if you are a holder of a credit card or a debit card that can also be provided as a identity but what you can't supply as identity is a library card or a social uh, social security card we don't have social security card in pakistan uh, but like you know ben uh, benazir income support program card that is a social security kind of a thing our library card these two types of cards are not eligible as identifications when you uh, are about to take your exam uh, you will be provided with a uh, few pencils and few scraps of paper paper sheets for your rough work and sometimes it is possible that your exam center may provide you with a physical calculator otherwise you are expected to use the calculator available on computer so the test center administrator and supervisor will also show you certain instructions they will ask you to read them and you have to follow them you naturally these instructions if you read uh, it clearly says that you do not have to cheat and do this or that so whatever those exam instructions are you must go through properly and abide by them now after you have done your pmp or pba and you have been certified for 3 years as pba by the time the 3 years are complete before that you must not only fulfill the requirements of 60 professional development units but also must be able to renew by paying 60 dollar if you are a member and 150 dollar if you are not a member your renewal will start immediately after the previous cycle has completed now what happens if you do not renew if you do not fulfill the requirement of 60 pd and your 3 year period is over dmi will give you send you a warning letter telling you you have been suspended your 3 years have passed we have been reminding you and you did not complete your ccr cycle requirements or pd use and you have not renewed your certification so you cannot write with your name pba anymore but we are not permanently deleting you from the list we are suspending you we will and we are giving you one more year during this year if you can fulfill those requirements and renew your certification your certification will start on the back date from the day the previous certification cycle had completed exactly from the next day onward you will be considered renewed so some people think that we will 
supply these details at the very end of the suspension year and then we will get 3 more years. No, you will not get 3 more years. You will get the remaining part of the 3 years. That means if you do it at the end of year 1, then you will have a renewal only for next 2 years. So don't wait for the suspension period to end because if it ends and you somehow mistakenly could not submit your application, you, your PBA status will be completely removed and vanished. You are never ever to be a PBA again. So don't go to that side. Simply uh, try to complete your requirements within the first three years and if something is left, do it very quickly in the suspension period and as soon as possible must get the renewal. So I hope I, I have clarified everything. Okay. As I said, for PBA, you need to have 60 PDUs. PDUs are professional development units and they are only required by certified professionals. Some people mistake it with the eligibility requirement. The eligibility requirement is number one, as I said before, number one, you must be a graduate with 16 years of education. You must have at least three years of experience and 35 hours, contact hours of education in project management or business analysis. So these are the three requirements. So. Uh, people call those 20, 35 hours as PDUs, which is absolutely wrong. They are not PDUs. PDUs are only applicable after you become a BM or a PBA. So when you become certified, certified only then you need PDUs. For there are four certifications which which require 60 PDUs to be attained: PMP certification. BBA certification, program management professional, portfolio management professional, each one of these certifications require you to gain 60 PDUs every three years. So then there are other certifications like scheduling professional, risk management professional and agile certified professional. They require only 30 PDUs after every three years. But those 30 PDUs must be from their specific area of specialization like SP they will show there are 30 hours in scheduling risk will show RMP will show 30 hours in risk management and ACP will show 30 hours in agile trainings so these are the basic mini, mini, minimum requirements 60 PDUs for those certifications PMP were and 30 for the others but as you are concerned with PBA so I will just talk about PBA but if you get more than 60 PDUs what will happen to the remaining PDUs will the remaining PDUs be transferred to your next cycle that is the question answer is yes some of the PDUs may be transferred to the next cycle how much? Not more than 20. So, no matter if you get 100 PDUs in first 3 years, maximum only 20 PDUs can move ahead into the next cycle. The rest, everything is wasted. 60 PDUs will be counted towards your first 3 years. 20 PDUs will go to the next cycle and 20 PDUs will be wasted. But there is a small little caveat about it. Those 20 PDUs which you are moving forward, they must have been attained in the third year of the cycle. If you have attained all 100 units in the first year and nothing in second and nothing in third, then you will not get any 20 PDUs for the next cycle. Only 60 PDUs will be counted for your current uh, fulfillment 
and remaining 40 will be thrown out. So you must uh, divide these PDUs over the years, 20, 20, 20, or maybe you gain 60 in first year, 10 in next year, 10 in next year, uh, even that is not fulfilling the purpose. 20 must be in the last year. So the best way is 20, 20, 20. Every year you gain 20 PDUs. So that way, uh, if there is any additional PDU, they are shifted to your benefit. So this is as far as the PDUs are concerned. So far so good. Okay. How do you get your PDUs? Professional Development Units 60 PDUs. Actually there are two categories in which you can get your PDUs. One is the Educational category and the other is the giving back to the profession category. Educational category you can get as many PDUs as you want. This is over. You can get all the 60 PDUs in education. You keep attending the trainings, advanced trainings in the area of business analysis and every time you attend any, attend any seminar or training you just keep collecting the certificates and keep counting those hours into your video. The other thing is giving back to the society, to the profession. Now this is a bit tricky because there are many ways of doing that. How do you do that? You can be an author of an article, writing a book or contributing in any way to the society, building any new knowledge or you know teaching some students in business analysis, uh, delivering volunteer activities uh, regarding business analysis and so on and so forth. All of these are giving something back to the profession. So, you can get some PDUs in that category as well. But the important thing about the PDUs is that very recently PMI has introduced a talent triangle. Now all the PDUs you get must be in accordance with this talent triangle. Talent triangle is divided into three parts. First is the base strategic and business management. This is your knowledge about strategy and business management. What are the goals and objectives, how your whatever you are doing is aligned with the organizational strategy and how it is going to uh, benefit the organization. So all these things strategic and benefit management is there. Second is technical work. If you are talking about business analysis the technical knowledge, hardcore knowledge of business analysis. As we have said, these five domains. So those all are the technical part of business analysis. And third is the soft skills, leadership, conflict management, negotiation, all that. This is all the third part. So the PDUs you are getting, they are going to be distributed in these three areas. <clears throat> Let me show you. What is included in strategic and business management? If you can read through this, you can see. Benefit management and realization. Business acumen. Business models and structures. Competitive analysis. Customer relationship and transaction. Industry knowledge and standards. Legal and regulatory compliances. Market awareness and conditions. Operational functions strategic planning analysis and alignment this all is part of strategic and business management and as far as the technical part is concerned agile practices play a very important role data gathering and modeling earned value governance requirement management and traceability risk management scheduling scope management etc this all is technical and towards the leadership side Brainstorming, coaching, mentoring, 
कंफ्लिक्ट मैनेजमेंट इमोशनल इंटेलिजेंस इन्फ्लुएंसिंग इंटरपर्सनल स्किल्स लिसनिंग नेगोशिएटिंग प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग टीम बिल्डिंग ऑल ऑफ दीज स्किल्स विल बी डेवलप्ड इन लीडरशिप सो यू जस्ट कांट डू इट दैट यू कीप लर्निंग अबाउट बिजनेस एनालिसिस एंड एनहांस योर टेक्निकल स्किल एंड क्लेम सिक्सटी पी डी यूज फॉर दैट नो यू दैट डज नॉट फुलफिल द पर्पज some of the pdus will have to be from the strategic and business management side some of the pdus will have to be from the leadership side otherwise your pdus will not be counted okay to view there are 60 docs these are the 60 pdus they could be divided into education and giving back let us see how much in education and how much in giving back as i said earlier for education there is no limit you can have all the pdus gained through new knowledge through education so you go and tra attend trainings and get these pdus all the 60 pdus can be brought from the education side but the restriction is minimum 8 pdus in each of the vertices of the triangle technical 8 pdus are required leadership 8 pdus are required strategic and business management 8 pdus are required so they come out to be 24 but that is not enough you uh, edu in education overall you must have 35 pdus ke the minimum number of pdus you must gain in education are 35 maximum is 60 i am only talking about education minimum 35 maximum 60 and out of the 35 at least 8 should be in technical side 8 should be in leadership 8 should be in strategic and business management that is true for 60 all if you have got 60 pdus still you must fulfill the condition of eight technical pdus eight leadership pdus and eight strategic pdus got this one so how many minimum pdus do you need to have from education 35 what could be the maximum 60 what is the minimum you must gain in each of the vertices 8 each in either case even if you have 35 or 60 pdus from education however the number of pdus are minimum 35 should be there 8 from each area and uh, it can uh, there is no upper limit they could be all 60 could be from the education now coming back to the uh, coming over to the next giving back to the profession now giving back to the profession naturally if 35 were mandatory for education then we are left with only 25 so you cannot gain more than 25 pdus from giving back category you can't claim 35 or 40 from here you cannot claim more than 25 from this area and out of those 30 uh, 25 pdus you cannot get more than 8 pdus based on your experience you can you say that i am working as a business analyst professional so i must be awarded some pdus for my experience for 3 years you will only get 8 pdus in that category remaining pdus what is 25 minus 8 17 remaining 17 pdus must be claimed out of voluntary doing some volunteer work without any payment and are creating some knowledge writing articles teaching people doing things so 24 pdus can be attained from that category so maximum 25 pdus in giving back 8 must be uh, can be maximum 8 can be working as a professional remaining 
17 could be from volunteering and creating knowledge. On the education side, I said you can you have no upper limit, but a minimum PD use you have to fulfill is 35, and minimum PD use in each area is eight each in technical leadership and strategic and business management. So this is all about your PD use. Right, any questions so far? You can call me if you like. दूसरा मैंने आपसे एक और बात पूछनी थी आ, ये तो मैं समझ रहा हूँ आज के ये जो कुछ भी बात हुई है इसको आप पिछले पिछला लेक्चर और आज का लेक्चर इसको तो आप आ, एक दफा रिव्यू कर लें क्योंकि बीच में गैप भी बड़ा आ गया ना तो आपने उसको अच्छी तरह से रिव्यू कर लीजिए